Welcome to the WordPress Photography Podcast, the podcast for photographers who want to learn how to get the most out of WordPress to grow their photography business. You don't need to be a geek to understand WordPress. Settle back and listen as we show you how. Now, here's your host, Scott wyden Kivowitz. Welcome to episode 30. My name is Scott wyden Kivowitz, and I'm joined by my co-host, Rachel Conley from Photoscribe. Hey, Rachel. Hey, Scott. How are you? Oh, I'm doing well. I uh, just got back from WordCamp US. As you can see, I'm wearing, um, if you're listening, you can't see, but if you're watching the video, you can see I'm wearing the WordCamp US 2016 t-shirt. Um, they're ac- I actually like the design. It's quite simple compared to others. Yeah, um, I'm jealous. <laughs> uh, I only went on the Friday. It was a Friday and Saturday, and then Sunday was Contributor Day, where anybody can sit down with the developers and designers and help contribute to WordPress core. So I got to talk to a lot of uh, really cool people, see a lot of cool products coming out, and see a lot of uh, great sessions. Um, one that came to mind that I really enjoyed, which oddly was not really about what it, the, t- the title was called. It was called Photo Blogging for the FBI. And it caught my attention, of course. Yeah. Uh, and I went to go s- to sit in it. Had nothing to do with photo blogging whatsoever, but it did have to do with the FBI, and it was really interesting. So wow. I can't wait till that's on Word- uh, WordPress TV. Um, actually, uh, now WordPress TV is actually going to be on YouTube as well. So um, uh, there'll be two different places that you can watch um, WordCamp videos, YouTube and WordCamp TV. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. and I heard that... Um... I was reading through the statistics of the Matt Mullenweg State of the Word, and like 30% of all of the WordCamp data t- are, are up on um, WordCamp TV, which mm-hmm. seems like a low number, but I really think because of the sheer number of WordCamps that happen around the world now, that's a really lot, that's a lot of content. Yeah, you know? yeah, and now the WordCamps, the, the bigger ones, are actually doing live transcriptions to, to anybody who is, uh, who is deaf. Oh, cool. So that t- obviously takes longer to produce, more expensive, and then uh, they also have to convert that into video, you know, right. like for for the internet. So, um, you know, I don't think we're going to be seeing all videos up on WordCamp T- or WordPress TV or, or YouTube, but um, we should be seeing a lot of them. So, Yeah, I mean, a part of it is, from my experience as a WordCamp organizer, some of the WordCamps that are more discussion, that have audience participation, are a little bit harder to tape and record. And and there is a lot of overlap. Sometimes a speaker will talk in Providence and then go talk in Maine here in the New England area. So, um, but I love that at least, you know, they're trying. And I love how accessible they are for everyone, because I think that's a big part of, you know, the open source community. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, uh, when I talked in WordCamp Philly, uh, I did the same talk that I did at WordCamp Boston and yep. the WordCamp Boston one actually went on to WordPress TV, but not uh, the WordCamp Philly. Version. Okay. So, okay. Um, yeah, it's a good example of of not everything being there, but yeah, it was the same. It was the same session, you know, same presentation. Right. Um, so. All right. So um, speaking of WordCamp, here's some news. Uh, Matt Molowick's, uh State of the Word at WordCamp US 2016 talked about what to expect from WordPress in 2017. Um, so unlike in previous years where there were set releases, um, really just three major releases, word in 2017, there will be no set releases. Basically, um, Matt's desire, and I think he's taking over lead of development 2017, which he hasn't done in a while, um, is all about user experience. Yeah. Finally. So he said, we're going to ha- see an improved editing system. We're going to be seeing an improved customizer and a lot more. For, for example, um, there's a uh, currently in testing. It's called the code name is Calypso. Basically, it's a WordPress desktop ap- application. It's for Windows and Mac. Yep. And right now it's just if you've ever seen a WordPress.com backend, this is what it looks like. Right. Um, basically, it looks like uh a very polished version of WordPress, and yeah. it's so much easier to use from a from a you know a non-technical standpoint than the WordPress.org, the the self-hosted software. So they're they're pushing hard for that desktop application, which actually pulls in that WordPress.com design um, for people to start using for their sites. Now, the downside is that it requires the use of Jetpack, so you have to use Jetpack the plugin in order to take take a advantage of this functionality. So what I did is I have Jetpack installed and the only thing active 
is the one part that will allow the connection to right. WordPress.com uh, and to be used in the desktop application. But here's the cool part of why I'm talking about this. They announced, or Matt announced, that they're opening up plugin integration into the desktop application. So they're only allowing plugins right now with over a million active users to take advantage of the integration. Wow. So they, re they actually reached out to us at Imagely to integrate NextGen Gallery into it. So we're wow. going to have a conversation this week with Automatic to see how that needs to happen. Because if that is the case, that means uh, there'll be literally desktop software to upload to a NextGen Gallery, which is, um, wow. you know, our Lightroom plugin's just about ready. Yeah. Um, but that'll be another place that people can upload to. And that's it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. So. I, I love the innovation they're doing. I, you know, I read through the state of the word and I thought it was interesting that he said, you know, we'll probably fall before we run. Um, yeah. So I think they're expecting ups and downs. And, yeah. and I think setting that expectation for users too. you know, obviously these are really first adopters that will hit it at first and the beta testers and then it will go to everybody. But I mean, the possibilities there, you know, this could totally eclipse the square spaces of the word and, and such. Um, and you guys, like, we've had this discussion about Jetpack a lot. I think, I think there is a, it, not a lot of great things about Jetpack, but the plugins that work, like I use it for Publicize, I use it for Vault Press. I mean, the key here, and now if, if it's, if it's integrating with the desktop app, I mean, the key is that you do go in and turn off the things that don't work or that you're not using. But yeah, I mean, yeah. you really should do that with any plugin too, right. you know? Yeah, um, well, it used to be that with Jetpack, but a while ago, like a long time ago, that if you Jetpack is designed where each module is you can disable. But right. a while ago, you would disable it and it would still be active running on your right. site. Right. You just wouldn't actually see it. Right. So it actually slowed down performance by having all these things you didn't need active. Right. Um, but now when you disable it, it actually does disable it. It doesn't run at all. Yeah. Um, so and I think that's I think, key. Yeah. Um, um, so... Along with that, WordPress 4.7 is now out. And we talked about this in previous episodes, but um, there's a few things that are really interesting that um, they're, they're doing. This is a whole start of uh, improved user, um, user experience. Uh, one being already the, um, the, the menu system in WordPress is probably the best menu system ever in any content management system. Right. But they just made it better. And I couldn't think of a way for them to make it better, but they actually did. Now, when you're editing a menu, whether you're doing it in the customizer or just in the back end under menus, you can actually add a new page right from the menu. Wow. And it'll create a page and it'll be blank, but it'll, you'll have a page done that you just added from within the menu system. So it's just wow. a quick way for you to add more menus, menu items and pages. Right. Um, and not have to go back and forth. And yeah, yeah that's cool. Yeah. I do um, love how they're focusing on the functionality. I mean, because these are intuitive changes that make yeah. sense but that didn't happen before yeah. um other things are like video header headers so uh up until now and you know even imagery themes uh, any any widget uh or any headers uh basically a big widget area that has a video background um it, it, it had to be custom made you had to custom make this okay but now wordpress supports it built in awesome and so now any theme can just use the same functionality that the new 2017 theme is using and take advantage of video backgrounds. And the cool part is um, it can you can upload an MP4 or you can link to a YouTube or Vimeo video and cool. it'll just automatically convert that into your That's video awesome. background. And That's then, of nice. course, like like what we do at Imagely, if you're on mobile, that video doesn't show. It actually converts to an image. Right, right. So, because um, being mobile responsive. Yeah, so there's a lot of cool things like that, including now you can do custom CSS within uh, within the customizer, which is a great thing, uh, and so many so many more things. But all of it is about improving the user experience, and that's right. a that's a great 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 thing. I'm so happy that. Well, doing and I think the most stuff. important statistic you don't have on our list here, but didn't the user? I mean, the um, WordPress now powers twenty per seven, twenty seven percent of that. Yeah, I yep. mean that's huge because it's our it's it's. It was was at 25 and I, you know i just uh, to see the growth of this is i mean it's validating obviously yeah, for what we do but i think and, it's and, awesome and a two percent in one year is a major jump yeah because so, <laughs> we're talking about jump. millions of websites yeah and the craziest part is is that yes 27 percent of the internet but when you look at e-commerce alone like yeah. if you just look at e-commerce woocommerce powers almost I'm I'm saying almost a hundred percent of that. 
Wow. Like WooCommerce is is the go-to for just a general store. Right. Which I'm is why for photographers, I'm automatic general store. bought it. <laughs> right. And made yeah. it part of their uh, core offerings. Yeah. No, I love yeah. it. I love so it. a lot of great things. Yeah. Um, so the next thing is uh, WordPress. This is also Matt announced this is WordPress now recommends um, only will recommend uh, hosting WordPress on host companies that support HTTPS and PHP 7. Now, yep. PHP 7 is not officially out yet. It's still technically, I believe it's still technically a beta for PHP, but it's it's been tested thoroughly. So uh, I know that uh, Imagely Hosting, for example, doesn't offer PHP 7 yet, but it will very soon once it's officially, you know, now that now that WordPress is recommending it, I, I see it happening sooner than later. Yeah. Um, but HTTPS also very important for security, for SEO now, and so many more, uh, so, many, so many other things. So um, WordPress officially changed their requirements on the WordPress.org uh, requirements page to those two things. Must have HTTPS, or we recommend, recommend yeah. HTTPS and PHP 7. Well, and PHP 7 actually will speed up your, your WordPress website big time. I think they're great about going forward and adapting to new technologies. Yeah. The problem is the legacy, the people that have set up a WordPress account, and, and I bet all of the people listening have done that and then sort of, you know, let it go and focus on another URL or another WordPress installation. Um, are those old installations still hanging out on servers somewhere at PHP 4 and HTTP, yeah, you know what well, I mean? And, yeah, so um, here's the thing. WordPress doesn't even support PHP 5.2 technically anymore. Right. Um, they, 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 the, the technical requirement, I think is 5.3 or 5.4 and up. And, uh, just yesterday we were contacted for support and most of the person's problems that he's having is because he's on Bluehost running for, uh, PHP 5.2. All, all this customer has to do is update, have Bluehost update his, his server to a, a more recent PHP. And all of his problems would go away. Right. So, but um, again, as a photographer with a thousand other things in your head, yeah, yeah. you know, who who has time to think about that, exactly. right? Yeah. So well, that's why having a host that that you know will update you automatically. Yeah. And SiteGround, for example, just announced that PHP seven is the default. Yeah. So any new installs are automatically getting PHP seven. So if you're on a host that's being proactive, I mean, we're doing five point six, I believe, of of PHP. There is no six. There's right. There, there's no well, that's, okay, so it. that's a good distinction um, too. I was like, yeah, okay. yeah. I don't know why they skipped it, but um, so uh, or, or maybe it was, but it was never official. It was just a beta. Who knows? Um, but um, but yeah, we're we're I think we're on we we do five point six, which is fine. That's more than sufficient. Um, but once you go to PHP seven, there's a big boost in in additional functionalities and and speed, um, which is which is a great thing. Yeah, so, awesome. Um, now my favorite bit of news. Which is a fun one to share. Why don't you share this one? Well, so Photoscribe, which is the company that I run, um, we we haven't really talked about what Photoscribe is, but we offer uh, a blogging service for professional photographers. So we help take the task of blogging away from you and still maintain your voice and, you know, help get you set up and, and on a schedule for SEO and keywording. Um, and we have merged with uh, another company in the photography space called Shoot.Edit. Um, and it's something that I'm so excited about. Um, the owners of Shoot.Edit, Jared and Garrett, are people that I really believe in. Um, their core values are very similar to mine. Um, and it just means that we can help service more professional photographers. So we are going to sit down, Scott and I, and talk about that in episode 31. Yep. Um, I've done over 2,000 blogs for photographers all around the world at this point. So we're going to talk about what, you know, why WordPress, why I'm such an advocate, what blogging means, um, and then how this whole transition um, and merge, what it means, why it happened. And why it's so good for photographers that are running WordPress. Yeah. I mean, we, we blog with photographers on all platforms. So we yep. blog with photographers on Squarespace, on Photobiz, on Showit, which, you know, Showit has a WordPress component. Um but WordPress really is the best blogging platform out there. And I know there's a lot of technical stuff, and that's why Scott and I work so diligently to help break down some of the scary parts of it. But it really is the best. So we're going to talk all about that in relation to blogging in the next yeah. episode. <laughs> yes, episode 31. Yes. Um, okay, cool. So um, this is a Q&A episode, but before we get into the Q&A, 
we uh, wanted to bring something up that has caught our attention uh, more than once recently. Yeah. And um, it's related to the pro photo theme. Now, pro photo uh, has been a dominant theme in the photography space for quite some time. Yep. Um, and they, uh, for a long time, they were not responsive. They're, right. What I mean by that is they don't automatically shrink down and they're not fluid on mobile devices. Right. They don't collapse down and, 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 and function uh, correctly on, a, on an iPhone or an Android. Right. But they and, do have a mobile option. So Yes. They, but, yeah. It's, it's sort of like a, like a WP Touch type of thing, I believe, right. where it's, but it's, it's more not, like a, a secondary site that it creates for your mobile. Right. Mobile. So when we say responsive, we're not saying that it doesn't have this mobile option, but A, a lot of photographers don't choose to load into that mobile option, and B, it's still not responding the way Google wants mobile sites to respond. Right. Yep. Um, now, Profoto 6, now we, Rachel and I both have not tested this, nope. uh, but Profoto 6 which came out, I think, a little after WPPI in 2016. Yeah. Um, that is supposed to be responsive. Now, although that's been out now for almost a year, uh, we haven't really seen too many sites running it. No. So we actually worry uh, and question the fact that our photographers updating their sites to be responsive because this is extremely important now for, for search engine optimization, especially with Google, that right. prefers mobile-friendly sites. Well, it's not only that it prefers it, it's that as a photographer, at this point, 70 to 80 percent of your traffic is probably yep. coming from mobile sites. So part of it is, you know, knowing Google Analytics, which is really hard to sort of dive into um, and, and understand the data that they're kicking back. But so if 70 to 80 percent of your traffic is coming from mobile, A, you want it to be mobile optimized. But then B, the problem that we're seeing is that um, again, pulling from that Google Analytics, and I work with a lot of photographers that are on Profoto 4 and Profoto 5, and they have beautiful sites, and it's exactly what they want design-wise, but even with blogging on a regular basis and doing all the keywording and being absolutely SEO optimized, they are getting penalized mm -hmm. negatively by yeah. Google simply because their site is Profoto and therefore not what Google considers mobile-friendly. Yeah. So um, uh, I think m the call to action here before we move into the Q&A is if you are running an older version of Profoto right. and you're happy with the theme, that's fine. I'm glad you're happy with it. Update to Profoto 6 and make sure that your site is responsive. The problem it. is, is it's not that simple because I know, part of I know. the Profoto 6 themes aren't all the pretty beautiful ones that Profoto 4 and Profoto 5 has. So I think right. Scott is right. That's the that should be the optimum solution. But I think in this case, if you're listening and you have a Profoto theme and you're not on Profoto six, my recommendation would be to reach out to Profoto and ask them that question. Can I just convert to Profoto six? Is my theme going to come over? Is there work that's going to be involved? Who's going to do that? Who do you recommend? Um, but the problem is waiting at this point is just going to get you lower and lower in the Google ranking. So you know, we usually say like, oh, wait until the next version comes out or there's more testing. But right now, if you're on Profoto 4 or on Profoto 5, um, the chances are that you're getting penalized negatively in Google. And the more time that goes by, the more your SEO will go down. So I don't want to be alarmist, right? But I have been seeing these numbers come in and, and it's just at a critical point where it's like, all right, we're going into the slow season, especially here in the Northeast. It's time to update your website if you're right. on Profoto 4 or Profoto 5. Yep. That's our PSA for today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so there you go. Um, all right. So let's move into the Q&A portion of this. So yes. um, this is the third of many Q&A episodes to come. Yep. Um, as always, we as we've said in the past, we hope to have a Q&A episode every 10 episodes. Um, so, uh, what we'll do is we'll do what we did in the past. We will, uh, do you want me to start with the first and then we'll rotate? Yep. Okay. So, uh, Alex asked, you have mentioned it before in your podcast, but I would like to hear an updated pro and cons of page, of, uh, page builder themes and plugins like Beaver, Divi, and so on. So, uh, I, we worked closely with Corey Potter from Fuel Your Photos to do an extensive test between the most popular page builders. And uh, we will link to that in the show notes. 
uh, but we did it so it's very unbiased. We we looked at data, we looked at facts, um, and we Corey and I both offer our opinions at the bottom. But uh, and I, I will tell you this, um, Corey before doing this test, Corey was a big advocate for Divi. Since doing this big analysis, he's no longer a big advocate for Divi. Um, that's that I will give you a little bit of a teaser. It's not saying Divi is a bad thing. There are reasons that he's no longer an advocate for it, and yeah. that is why you need to read the the blog post. And uh, we I do have it on the list to uh, add more. I think I have five or six more page builder plugins to go through with Corey, and that is uh, a to do once we both have time. And we will just basically be updating that so it is uh, the most epic and extensive comparison. And I'm not saying from a uh, from a super coding technical standpoint, this is a no. It's really what great. photographers need to know. It, yeah. it, we break it down, yeah, uh, to, so that you can make an educated opinion on what is best for you. Yeah, I really so. recommend this blog post. I mean, you guys have done so much work in terms of testing and you know talking intelligently about it and talking within the sphere of photography too. So yeah. I recommend. Uh, and, and by the way, we're also it, it's not we're, we're not doing. Um, page builder themes we're only doing plugins right so for example the divi one in the in this post is their plugin which is not updated to their latest version their latest version is three which is a, a whole new ui improvement a user experience improvement uh, but that 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 divi three is only the theme right now so plugin users can't actually access that um so once divi updates the plugin to divi three uh we will be redoing the divi um part of this we won't be just um, replacing it. We'll be adding a Divi 3 version to okay. it. So the good um, news is, is not only is that blog post informative, you guys are keeping it updated as well. Yeah, well, we will be, yeah. We yeah. haven't updated it since it, since we published it, but <laughs> uh, we will be, yeah. <laughs> so question number two, Alex also asked, image size, how many pictures in one gallery for speed? Um, this is a tough answer because... And I'm going to read what Scott wrote, and then I have some of my own thoughts too. But So that's a tough answer because you can have one image in a gallery, and it could be huge and file size, and in turn be extremely slow. So I'll answer it like this. Before the internet portfolios were no more than 20 images per category or book, I'd use that mentality for your photography website. Each gallery should contain no more than 20 photos, all of which should be optimized for speed as well as looking good. I agree. Um... I think 20 photos is a good number. It's hard to put a number. Uh, I struggle with this with blog posts as well. You know, should you have 10, 20, 100? I think for blog posts, it's important to tell the story. For galleries, it's important to showcase your absolute favorite images that are current and that show the things you want to sell. I don't, I, I don't even think it needs to be just favorites. I think it needs ab absolute best because right. sometimes your favorites are not actually your best work. That's just, a, yeah, that's a good opinion know. too. And I mean, it, I've got my favorites, like if you're watching behind me, I got a bunch of photos. Um, uh, the one that the mic is actually blocking is a gorilla's hand. It's not my best work, but it's one of my favorites because it just makes me love life because it's like such a big animal that's so gentle. Yeah. Um, it's not my best work, I, it, but it's a favorite. You know, but, so but you can argue yeah. that too. It, I think you want to show your favorites to show who you are as an artist. Yes, it should yeah. be your best favorites. You could you could also break down your portfolio as your actual portfolio and then your own personal favorites. Yeah, that's true too. Um, but I think the key here is exactly what Scott said, all of which should be optimized for speed as well as looking yeah. good. So before it ever gets to your website, it should go through um, the, what is it, JPEG Mini. Yep. Should be optimized coming out of Lightroom. Um, so or Photoshop, yeah. right? Uh, you, and so I also use Blogstomp Fundy in there too for image collaging. And you probably aren't going to use that for the wet for the portfolio because you're not collaging. That's more of a blog thing. But I mean, there's so many amazing tools that won't won't when you compress it won't take away from the image, but will make sure that it's the smallest. And in some cases that's almost more important than how many you're putting up. It is making sure that whatever that number is for you, that they're optimized for speed. Yeah. Great. Uh, okay. Joel asks, do I really need Smug Mug if I have a WordPress website? I get this question a lot. Yeah. Um, and, and insert Smug Mug for Zenfolio, yeah, yeah. right? I mean, whatever. Yeah, for any, any, any third party. Right. Um, so... My answer is no, you do not, uh, because you can do everything 
that is possible with Smug Mug on WordPress and then some, except for Print Lab integration. Uh, now, if you're watching, uh, I'm going to be winking here, yeah. uh, but that will change soon. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, Print Lab integration for WordPress is in the works. Uh, once that's done, then you'll have everything that Smug Mug can do and more with no exceptions. Right. Um, but right now, the only exception is Print Lab integration. So if you really need Print Lab integration, then right now, yes, you, you do need a Smug Mug or Zenfolio or Photo Shelter. Um, but otherwise, WordPress so can do it. So the benefits of having the Smug Mug be mm. beyond the Print Lab integration is that you're not hosting it on your server as well. So if you have the Bluehost that we talked about, which is a shared server where you don't have as much space and you're not optimizing images, Smug Mug provides a service that you can upload those 5,000 pixel images and not have to worry about speed. If you do that on your WordPress, which the tools are there, um, you own it. You don't ever have to worry about it going away or... Like the weird thing with Zenfolio offering um, albums. So if you don't know, if you have Zenfolio, they now have an option where if you have um, it set up so that you can sell prints, it also, is, your clients will get a notice saying, we can make an album for you, thereby, you know, bypassing a stream of revenue for you, et cetera, et cetera. So you actually have to opt out of that. And there was a lot of confusion when it first started from photographers who are like, what is this? This is taking away from my business. So anytime you're not on your own WordPress website, you're dealing with someone else's structure that you don't own. Um, so there are pros and cons to both, but you absolutely can uh, do it all on WordPress web website. And then we should say with uh, key plugins, and we recommend the Next Gen Gallery in this case, there are a few others. I think Sunshine is another one. Um, but, you know, the ones that we've tested and found to be the most robust are the next-gen gallery. So, cool. Sarah asked, is there such a thing as a bad page builder? Um, yes. Many page builders <laughs> can slow down your site. Some are complicated to use because, it's you know, they're supposed to be simplifying. Some break other plugins, some don't work with all themes, some rely 100% on short codes. So if you ever disabled it, you'd lose all your content and replace that with a mess of short codes. Um, and I think short codes is the biggest issue for sure. So I actually have a one of my websites, which is all short codes. So what short codes are, are especially with uh, page builders, is you go in and you, you know, you open it up in another window and it, you make all your sort of drag and drop beautiful things, but what WordPress sees is just a different kind of code. It's not an HTML code, it's not CSS code, it's these short codes that rely on the plugin. So if you yeah, take so away the plugin, then your words go away too. No, it's, so it's not just the design. So that's really the problem with short codes. Go ahead, Scott. Right. Yeah, so short codes are good when they're used for certain things, for example, uh, when you insert a next-gen gallery or you insert a WordPress gallery, it's inserting a shortcode. Right. Uh, but that's fine because it's that it that is all it's doing. But when your entire website is built, designed based on shortcodes, that is a bad thing because right. uh, now if if something ever happens and or you ever change themes or whatever, uh, all hell could break loose. <laughs> that's, there's no other way to put it. And it, uh, it, it your your design will just not. What your design would exist, and all you see is a, a whole lot of short codes and text right. that just doesn't Makes make any sense. sense. Yeah. And it it's not the fault of you as the photographer. I mean, part of it is the changing technology, and for a long time, short codes were the default to communicate between plugins and WordPress core. So, like Scott said, with the galleries, it makes sense in a lot of situations. Contact but, forms, right? They do the same thing, right? But when we're talking about these page builders that are trying to make the process of design easier and they do it in the way of short codes now that the technology has changed things can break so again you know we can refer you back to the work that scott and corey did with that blog post about the best page builders because they take into account things like short codes and again having a short code plugin versus a short code theme is definitely better because then you don't have to worry about updating as much and child themes. I mean, this is where they there can be layers upon layers. So, yeah. you know, 
go back to that blog post and see which one works for you. But yes, there are quote unquote bad ones. Um, so I wouldn't just install one and see what it does. I would definitely do research first. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Daniel. Uh, Daniel asked, uh, my theme says it's powered by the XYZ. Is that bad? I'm not sure what XYZ was, but... Um, <laughs> well, I know Profoto does it. Um, oh, yes, yeah, so that's what they're saying. Yeah, 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 that's what he's saying. So he's saying um, in the footer, it says this site... Imagely does it too by default, but you can turn it off. Um, right. That this site is powered by Imagely, this site is powered by Profoto, Photocrati, Flow Themes does it. They all... Uh, most do it, right? Right. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. It could take away from your branding a bit. So I'd recommend seeing if the theme has an option to turn it off. Um, most premium themes that include that have it optional. Right. Uh, free themes might include it with no other choice because it's a free theme and they want you to, you know, they want people to click over to their paid product. Um, right. Now, if you're using a free theme and you don't have an option to turn it off, you can probably hide it with some custom CSS. Um, I will say that if you're, uh, if you do have it turned on, even if it's a premium theme, uh, the hopefully the theme developer is making that link no follow um, because it, it could be bad if you're linking to the same site that, you know, thousands and thousands of other people are in the same exact place on the site and, and whatnot. So, yeah, um, I mean, so I wouldn't even that that seems really technical, but it is. Yeah. Yeah. I, hopefully, hopefully the theme developers are doing it right if they are including it. But I would say simply, if you can turn it off, turn it off. Uh, if you can't, it's not the end of the world. Or if you love the theme, you know, it is a way of acknowledging and saying thank you to a certain theme or a certain, you know, host in the case of Imagely. Like, they, it's sort of like giving image credits in some ways that they developed it, you're using it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. I do say... I would be wary of the if they don't give you the option to turn it off. Even if you just reach out to like whoever designed the free theme and said, I'd like to turn this off, they should give you that custom CSS to do it so that you don't have to do the custom CSS part yourself. Um, sometimes you have to pay to turn it off, and I thought that was kind of mm -hmm. weird. Like, Yeah, I think Flow Themes has a uh, plugin you have to install that removes their branding instead yeah. of it just being an option. They have to actually install a plugin to remove their branding. Right. Um, but, but it's not bad. It's not taking away from your site. It's just telling other people that your theme is made by XYZ. Right. So. Yeah. That's it. So, yeah. cool. All right. All right. Jennifer <laughs> asked, is it harmful to my SEO to, to have pages like a pricing brochure, printing info, slide source for client that are not linked within the site and the only way someone can access them uh, is by if I send them the URL? Um, harmful to SEO? No. But if the links and files are not protected, then they could show up in search results. PDFs, for no example, are notorious about that. With Yoast SEO, you can also set up specific pages and posts to not be indexable by search engines. Um, Scott does this for his proofing galleries, which are also password protected. And um, I have to agree totally because uh, Yoast SEO makes it really nice. So if you have a pricing brochure, uh, slide uh, slideshow for clients are a little bit, well, Scott does it actually, so you do it for proofing galleries, which are also password protected. Yep. Um, and you do that through NextGen plugin, right? Well, yeah, so I insert a proofing gallery with NextGen Pro, but the actual page that it's on is where what I password protect. Okay. And, and that's, I actually have um, what's called a custom post type for proofing galleries. So okay. instead of it being on a page or a post, I actually have it on a proofing page. Yeah. Um, and by default, I have all of those proofing pages not indexable. Um, right. through Yoast. So that's the key. You want to make sure it's not indexable. I think having right. a pricing brochure that you send to your clients when they reach out is a great use of WordPress and its functionalities, and it won't hurt your SEO, but you need to make sure that Google can't find it in another way. There's a yep. fire truck going by. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that's the key part. It, it, it'll never hurt your SEO, but if you're you know, trying to not have someone just stumble on it, then you need to make it non-indexable, and you can do that with the Yoast SEO plugin. Yeah. The the trick, though, is that um, 
Yoast won't actually uh, stop indexing of a PDF or something that is just, you know, like any file that you uploaded to a media library but didn't want found. Um, so that's the trickiest part. You can uh, go into Yoast SEO and turn off media from being indexed. So it actually won't index your media library at all. Um, but would that hurt photographers then not showing up in the image searches? No. So all that's doing is it's stopping another sitemap from, from showing up. Okay. Um, but the way that Yoast does images in sitemaps is the images are actually in the post and pages sitemap. So it's okay. actually separate. So it's just um, media is just a whole other sitemap you can have for whatever reason. It's not necessary, though. Interesting. Oh, that's uh, good to know. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Steph asked, for those of us who use Squarespace, what the F can we do to boost our SEO? I totally get it. It doesn't have the bells and whistles of WordPress, but I'm sticking with it for now because it's what works for me. So what tools can I use or what can I use within the platform to really work it? So um, <laughs> we've talked about Squarespace a lot. I will yep. say, be aware that Squarespace does things to harm your SEO by default. These are default settings that you can ha that you would have to change right. um we've covered that previously on the podcast um and you can also find blog articles about it just go to imagely blog or the photoscribe blog and search yeah. for squarespace and you'll see a lot of content on this um so yeah you you got a little bit that's not in your favor um but make sure that you turn off the default ex exit data stripping yes um make sure you turn that off make sure that your images are not being renamed that your uh, all text is still in there and it's the way you want well, you're, uh, and then, so the exit de default data, you can uncheck. Your images will be renamed. You yeah. need to go in and then manually Re rename them back to whatever you want. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then as far as what you can do to help your SEO, use the tools from moz.com and see what is not going well on your site for SEO and what you can improve. Uh, I will say, if you want to learn a lot more about SEO, uh, I will point you to Corey from Fuel Your Photos because he's he's knocking out of the park with uh, with education on it. Um, so I am going to direct you to Corey. Awesome. Um, so. <laughs> and, and I think having a tool like Moz or Corey where you pull back uh, and say, you know, here's a screenshot that my uh, SEO isn't doing well and I'm using Squarespace. The, the leverage there is that you send it to Squarespace because the whole point of being on Squarespace and paying for it is because you're paying for the service and their help and yeah. you know they are committed to offering you the best service and a lot of people don't use that so you know if you do find something that's not working for you send it to squarespace and say why isn't this working to, for me what can i do yeah. and if their answer is ever you know like there's nothing we can do i mean that to me is an indication that it's time to leave i yeah. i haven't heard that happening um but that, would that, be the that point. yeah that kind of falls into the content ownership side of things, right. um, which I love talking about. The fact that if if they are limiting what you can do, right, that proves that they own they own you. Right. <laughs> they they're, again, they're holding you back. We haven't heard of that happening. I'm just saying that yeah, yeah. if you use Moz, you get a red somewhere. You send it to Squarespace, and they say we can't do that, which I don't think they do. I think they will say here's how we can help. Right. Um, but that's the point at which. Personally, I would be like, okay, and I, I, there are people that I recommend Squarespace for because of its ease of use, because of its, you know, hand-holding, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, that's which, what you're paying for. Which we might see change in 2017. Right. Again, <laughs> with all the WordPress stuff coming Yay. up. So. All right. But it is um, an alternative. That's why people yeah. use it. Yeah. Um, okay. okay. Jill asked, I've heard WordPress is the absolute bomb. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes in order to update or customize, some people have said that they are frustrated because of the code, quotes, you have to know to manage it yourself. Thoughts for your average non-code writing photographer. So, I mean, that's the point of the whole podcast, right? Mm -hmm. yep. um, you shouldn't need to code anything. There is always a theme or plugin out there that can do what you need. There are even page builder plugins that can let you drag and drop for unlimited design potential. See question number one. See blog <laughs> posts from <laughs> Corey and Scott. Um so that's the beauty of WordPress is that it, there really are solutions for everything. Yeah. Uh, the, the 
challenge is finding it, making sure that the solution that you're finding isn't an outdated solution, right. um, and making sure that the solution that you're finding is really optimized for photographers, because photographers with their images have different needs than other small businesses and other e-commerce businesses too. Um, so those are the caveats. But do you need to know HTML or CSS? Like I know enough to be dangerous, but I couldn't code a page in HTML or CSS from scratch. But I use WordPress yeah. all the time. It it couldn't it couldn't hurt to learn the absolute bare minimum of HTML. Right. Like the just the you know how do I make a link <laughs> in HTML type of stuff. Right. Um, that kind of thing can't hurt to learn, but you don't need to learn anything more. And if you if if you really if what you're using on WordPress requires you to learn more, then you're not using the right theme or plugin on WordPress. Right. And right? I mean, it's, just... it's not even that you need to know how do I do a link in HTML. You need to know how to Google it. Because if you Google yeah. it, it comes up right away. It gives yep. you the HTML code. You literally just copy and paste. And I mean, we're talking extreme situations where, you know, you're in your blog post or your page and it's just not working. So for someone who did know HTML, they would switch over to the text view. They would put in the, the not custom HTML, but they would modify the HTML that wasn't working to work. Yeah. But again, the question there is why isn't it working? Yeah, you know, it's funny uh, on that, uh, for the, you know, two years ago, I, I, I wanted to do a certain thing with uh, what's called a div, um, which is an HTML thing. And I couldn't, I didn't know how to do it. So I Googled it. And I had to do this like 10 times or whatever. And I kept Googling it and Googling it. And I knew what it was. I was even Googling what it was. I just couldn't remember the exact HTML yeah. for oh, what I was trying to do. Oh, I do it all the do. time. Yeah. And, and now I can do it, you know, without even thinking about it. So sometimes it's just a matter of doing it and doing it and doing it um, right. to learn something. Right. So some something very simple. And I'm pretty good with it. But uh, it's just one thing I've always kept slipping my mind. So. Um, well, and yeah, I think yeah, Google. <laughs> Google was invented for coders first, I feel like, because... <laughs> You know, oh, what was I was listening to a podcast. Um, it was Tech Talk, how things work, and it was specific about bugs, design bugs. And there was a, a a spaceship that went to Mars, and it went off course because there literally was one character wrong. Like this is what these computer scientists do for you know. They, they code and every little punctuation matters, right? So even people who have a degree in it are out there Googling like, okay, make sure I get the right code where it's supposed to be. So, you know, I think you don't have to be a computer scientist to run WordPress. And I think to be a photographer, you have to have your own unique set of skills. So there's so many tools out there there's so many it's yep. just that you have to know to google it you have to know to go and look for it instead yep. of just being like i don't know i give up yep exactly all right um sam asked what is the optimal output size for wordpress so that uh images are showing at native size now this is tricky we've talked about this uh, mm -hmm. when we had uh, flow themes on we talked about image sizes um I'm going to give you my recommendation and you just have to find your own way. Um, I'm even working on a bunch of Lightroom export um, presets for image sizes and it'll depend on your host uh, for and your website site speed to determine what you should use. But um, basically for websites on slower hosts like shared hosting, I recommend images no larger than 1600 pixels at the longest length. So I don't care what the crop is. The 1600 pixels at the longest length at most. Yep. Uh, but for images on faster hosts, going up to 2048 pixels would be okay. And that is actually the optimal size for an iPad screen. Right. Okay. So uh, by going 2048 or even 1600 pixels, you're going to be fine on a desktop. Yep. Now, if you're on a 30 inch screen, which most people are not viewing your website on a 30 inch screen, then, you know, 1600 would, would be quite small. But, um, most people are viewing it on a 15 inch screen or smaller. So 1600 pixels or 2048 is more than efficient. Well, I, I think the question is too, nobody's viewing on a 30 inch screen except, you know, maybe yeah. if you're <laughs> in person sales yeah, yeah. You know, session, but 70 to 80% uh, of your web traffic is on webs is on mobile. So is it more important to, for the one case of the 30 inch screen or is it uh, more important for the seven to eight cases of mobile? And it's always more important for mobile right now. Well, what I will say is if you are worried about doing presentations through your website, 
to an I, an Apple TV, to a you know a, a big TV or whatever, or a projector, then my recommendation is make sure that whatever plugin that you're using for your gallery to display this does Retina. Oh, because that's that way, yeah. that way your images are large, but then also being distributed smaller on smaller screens so the right. site still loads fast. Right. And that's a, uh, that's very important. And then the last part about it is your theme. So again, going back to Profoto, Profoto has theme specific requirements and it's above the publish panel and it will say the optimum uh, size for this theme is, and, and it's usually random, like 1131 pixels. So uh, the, you know, the 1600 and the 2048 are just generic best practices so, for b any theme, but often some themes have theme specific sizes to it. Yeah. You know, so. yeah. So like, yeah, Profoto has its own gallery system, which requires a certain size right. or smaller. Um, but if you're, when I say 1600 pixel or 2048, I'm talking about when viewed in a light box, like a modal pop-up. Right. Um, right. You know, on if you're just looking at it on a, you know, in a thumbnail gallery, it's going to be tiny. So, right. you know, but hopefully your 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 theme or your plugin for your gallery is actually creating thumbnails specifically right. for that for those. And the twenty forty eight so. is the best for those light room, not light room. What did you just say? Light box. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Getting old, guys. So the twenty forty eight is optimized for the light box mm -hmm. on an iPad, but Correct. again, the sixteen hundred is for shared hosting plans that you may not have enough server space for all of your images to be twenty forty eight. Or just or slower server so that like sixteen hundred pixels um, at the most means that your site will load faster than if you had a two thousand forty eight pixel image. Right. And again, yeah. running it through JPEG Mini to get the most yeah. out of your space, making sure that when you do pull it out of Lightroom and Photoshop, like we mentioned before, it's yeah. optimized too. So, all right. Question number 10. LF asked, do pop-up plugins know if a visitor has always clicked? Uh, let me try that again. Do pop-up mm -hmm. plugins know if a visitor has already clicked on a pop-up and will know not to show another pop-up? Um, yes, usually lead generation plugins do indeed track pop-up engagement and you can actually um, change different settings. You can not have it pop up unless they've been on your site for 30 seconds or longer or shorter or um, and if they're visiting your site again or they're coming from another page, the plugin will give you options of do you want it to come up again? Do you not want it to come up? Um, so if you are installing a pop-up plugin, which usually is for the purposes of sign up for my email list, make sure you go into the settings and adjust them accordingly to what you would want to do as a user. Yep, exactly. Yeah, don't think about it from your standpoint. Think about it from your user, you know, with you as secondary because right. your preference might not match what your user's uh, experience might be. So, right. um, and it's always about testing. So yep. do A, A, B testing if your pop-up system uh, allows it. Uh, your lead, I'm going to call it a lead generation system, not a pop-up system. Um, uh, always do A-B testing if your lead generation system allows it. Always do manual testing if it allows it. Check your analytics, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, go on someone else's computer, go on a PC, go on a Mac, you know, yeah. go in incognito on your phone so they don't know that it's you. I mean, yeah. testing itself. And, and we should probably talk about what A-B testing is, but in the world yeah. of uh, real, true advertising, they have a version A and a version B running simultaneously. So if any one person jumps on a website or an ad, they don't know which version that they're getting, but you do and you can track as to which one converts better, yada, yada, yada. It's all, yeah, it's, exactly. it's living in the data-driven world. Yeah, and some A-B testing is limited to only A or B. Some are A through Z, you can do unlimited. Yeah. Um, I think those are called a, a, a to N testing or something like that. There's I don't know, a, it's a another, lot of work. It's yeah. a lot of work. But, um, but it's 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 usually worth it because you really find out um, either what colors work best yeah. or what text works best or what calls to action work work best or what imagery works best. Yeah. Um, so I will say it also a list a little. Let's give a little. I'll give a little tip at the here at this at the end here. Um, you know, if you um, if you want to try something new, that. It's not new as far as the technology goes, but it's new as far as photographers experimenting with this. Check out push notifications for your photography website. I'm finding that push notifications have a much higher conversion rate uh, 
compared to a lead generation pop up. Yep. Um, so now push notifications are not necessarily lead generating because you don't get, uh, as far as emails go, you don't get email addresses. They could be lead generating as far as getting people to come back to the site and to read your content, to download something new, to, um, to, to you know, contact you. Um, and there's a lot of them out there. Some are, some charge, some are free. Um, some offer A-B testing, some do not. Um, but the conversion rates are really impressive. Do you have and, one you recommend? Uh, so I've used, uh, there's two that I've used. I recently just switched. Um, if you want a very basic one that only works in Safari, I think it only works in Safari, then check out um, uh, Push push Up Notifications. It's from a company that you know well, 10up. Yeah. Um, and uh, you can get, for like $3 or $5 a month, you can get basic push notifications that when you publish a new blog post, it goes out. Right. Um, and right now it's only one browser. I can't remember if it's Chrome or Safari only, but uh, I just switched to OneSignal, which is a pain in the butt to set up. It's extremely technical to set up. Uh, push, push up notifications is like anybody can set it up. Um, but uh, OneSignal, you actually need to follow these instructions line by line to figure out how to set it up. But you can set it up for... Firefox, Safari, Chrome, iOS, if you want to, which is a, I didn't go that far because it's really difficult. Um, Android, Kindle Fires, um, you can set it up for pretty much every device. Um, so I did all the majors and it's been doing really well. And you got a little bit of customization in there too. Uh, and you can schedule push notifications and do A-B testing. So awesome. if, if you have the patience to go through all the technical stuff, then one signal because it's 100% free, I would say that. Um, but if you want something extremely basic, start with push up and see how it does. And you can always switch if you need to, uh, you can't migrate your subs subscribers, um, from one platform to another, but, uh, you know, it, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of them out there too, though, but cool. all right. Well, that's a good place to end. Yeah. Um, so let me just, uh, I forgot, I, I didn't think I was going to talk about that. So I'm going to make sure that's in the push up and then one signal. Okay. Um, so this has been another great Q and a episode. Episode 40 will be another 10 questions. So if you want to contribute to episode 40, uh, go to imagely.com slash podcast slash Q and get your questions in there. I think we already have a couple, uh, started. So awesome. I look forward to getting uh, another 10 to, to, for us to answer, yeah. um, in, in episode 40. Um, again, that's imagely.com slash podcast slash Q. Q. And if you want to read the show notes uh, or read really the show notes from today's episode will be the questions and also the links of products and companies we talked about, uh, go to imagely.com slash podcast slash 30. 30. So, yes. 30. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot of links for you. Sorry. But um, yeah. So Next episode, in episode 31, we're going to be talking about Photoscribe and Shoot.Edit and what it means for the photography industry, yep. what it means for you, the listeners of this podcast, because you are blogging, you are creating content, and this is really important because Photoscribe does a little bit more than just blogging. Right. We well, we, we do more than just writing. We right. do. We are full service for photographers in terms of uploading, keywording. You know, writing is actually some of the smallest portion of it, but yeah. Yeah. no, really exciting things. Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy with this. So we'll be talking about that uh, uh, in the next episode. Awesome. So until then, see ya. Bye. You've been listening to the WordPress Photography Podcast. To listen to other episodes and to subscribe to the podcast via iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and more, please visit imagely.com forward slash podcast. 